So what he said to me was, because I'm picturing this, feed the river. And it's fascinating to me, by the way, that he started with this, because I'm also thinking of other ways we feed the river. But this is the first place he took me. But I've been praying into this. So when I saw this, what he said to me was, I want you to tell my people to stop cursing their cities. I want you to tell them to stop cursing other cities. I want you to tell them to start pouring salt in, to cleanse, to heal. How do you do that? Well, mostly you do it right here. You start speaking blessing over San Francisco, New York, L.A., any place else you think is really over the edge with, with their wickedness. When you drive through parts of your city or neighborhood, or maybe you should intentionally drive through some of those places where the drugs flow big time and the violence and the poverty and the pain and roll your window down and just start speaking. You don't have to roll your window down, but to me, that's kind of the prophetic act I do. I just sort of roll it down. More power goes out the window. I don't care if you believe it or not. That's just the way it works for me. I just start speaking. I break the curse over this neighborhood. I break the curse of drugs and violence and death off of this neighborhood. I break the curse of poison. You will no longer cause barrenness and abortion and death and pain and break up families in this neighborhood. You're not going to do it here anymore. I cleanse this neighborhood in Jesus' name. I'm just simple enough to believe that if we start doing that, it's going to make a difference. That the power of God is going to go out of our mouths and start hovering in those neighborhoods. I believe God wants to come to some of these depraved places and turn them into strongholds of life and blessing and peace and salvation. So I'm challenging people. To feed the river. Where curse and poison and defilement rules. Because God's ready to start proving himself. He'll surprise us in the coming days with some of the places revival breaks out. He'll surprise us. You mark my words. He will surprise us. And some of those, some of those things I mentioned, the drugs and the, you know, just the immorality, things of that nature. I don't think they hear, I don't think they make God as angry as pride and religion. I know I get, I get some people irritated when I say that. I think he hates pride more than any of it. And the spirit of religion is so evil he crucified him. I think to the people that are just messed up, they don't, they don't offend God near as much as the, as the self-righteous crowd and the arrogant and the, and the people that are mean. I keep feeling like I'm supposed to share this one more story. I'm gonna do it very briefly. It's only 12.07, so you can hold out for another five minutes, okay? So, to get your stomach under control. 
But you know, the Jesus people movement started at Berkeley. And one of the, was one of the strongholds of the drugs and, and sex and sexual revolution and a drug revolution. It was one of the beginning places, Berkeley. So if you trace the Jesus people movement back to its roots, you always end up at Berkeley. But then if you trace what happened at Berkeley back to its roots, you always end up with, in part, with a guy named Hubert Lindsay, and they called him Holy Hubert. So I see heads on. Some of you know of, have heard of, how many have heard of Holy Hubert? Okay, several people in the room have. He's a small guy, you know, nothing about him that would appear, come across as charismatic or powerful. It kind of reminds me of what I envisioned the Apostle Paul being like. History says, I don't know if it's true or not, that Paul was kind of short in stature and kind of a, a small man outwardly in his body. But that's the way Holy Hubert was. But he was a brilliant man, but, but small and not charismatic at all. And I mean that in the literal sense, not the, Christ, not the church sense, you know, like smooth and a lot of charisma. That, that wasn't the way he was. But he, God put a burden in his heart for those kids, that, that generation, and, and a partic in particular, Berkeley. So he became one of the guys that started preaching on the campus. They literally had places set up at Berkeley where you could just preach and crowds would gather. It was a big deal back then in the 60s. <clears throat> Not just preach the gospel, preach about anything. They didn't call it preaching. You know, you could just give your speeches or whatever. But here's what struck me the most about this man when I heard him talk about it. The key to what God did was not his great messages. The key was he said, I used to walk the streets of Berkeley all night, weeping. He said, Lord, give me these kids. Give me these kids. And he watered the soil of that campus with his tears of intercession. And hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people came to Christ because of what started at Berkeley. And the world really never heard much of him. He was older, way up in years when I first heard him speak. This was in the 80s. His wife eventually died from some of the beatings that they received. He had gone blind. blind. He had this nervous tick. He'd talk and he'd do this. And all from the beating. I just can't, can't imagine what it was like when he got to heaven, Randy. How he was able to really, 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 really embrace how worth it, it was. But I'm t I feel like the Lord wanted me to tell that story because he just needs, he's going to need people that don't have to have a pulpit. They don't have to have, a, 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 they have to be well known. They don't have to be called a pastor. They don't have to be anybody that anybody really knows. He, he just needs some tears. 
He needs somebody that will walk the streets and pray and sow in tears. <laughs>